Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Corner Brook Baptist Church this morning. We're glad that you're here. We're going to start by reading Psalm, a few verses from Psalm chapter 34, verses 9 to 14, as we prepare our hearts to gather in the Lord's presence today. Psalm 34, starting in verse 9, says, Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Well, let's pray as we begin. Lord, thank you for this day that you have made. Help us as we gather here to remember that we are your people and that you have given us all good things through Jesus Christ. So help us today to listen to you, to learn the fear of the Lord, to, to learn what you require of us, and to know, most of all, that you made a way for us to be with you forever. So guide through everything that we do today, and I ask this in your name, amen. Okay, guys, let's stand and bring a praise offering to our King. Turn to you. 
feet. Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 8, 18, <clears throat> Moses said this to the people, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Remember God, it is he who has provided for you. Our finances, the way we handle our finances, actually, actually reflect our gratitude for God's provision. We recognize God as the source of our ability to generate wealth, and our financial choices should reflect that gratitude. And so this morning, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward as we take up our offering and as we pass the plates, this is an act of worship, even though we may give through other means, uh, electronically and so on. And if you're a guest here today, we want to let you know that you do not have to feel obligated to give. If you do, we simply welcome it as a gift to the work of God. So the ushers will take up our offering and then come back to the front for prayer. you are the eternal God, and now we give you our tithes, our offerings, out of gratitude, for, out of our love for you. We know that our financial giving, though, is not the only thing that you require. You tell us to take the gospel to the whole world. You tell us to love you with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strength. We're told to love our neighbors as ourselves. So in all things in our lives, I pray that you will give us the desire to follow you in love and service. And I pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> well, again, good morning. Those that may be watching online, we're glad that you can join us. We have, um, there's some announcements in your bulletin. I'm just going to encourage you to read what's in your bulletin. Uh, there's information there concerning board nominations and other things that are happening this summer. Do you realize next Sunday is the last Sunday in August? Like, we blinked and summer was gone. So, which means a couple things. We have two Sundays left. The last Sunday in August, first Sunday in September, back to our 11 a.m. start time. So just note that. We'll, we'll have that in the bulletin for you for next week. And uh, also, just to let you know, some of you have asked, some of you came in and thought, I thought you were going to be gone today. So I'm taking vacation starting tomorrow, and I'll be gone for the next three Sundays. And uh, so probably I'll be in Nova Scotia for part of it, depending on the ferry tomorrow, I guess. We're keeping an eye on things. But this time we'll go to prayer.
which is why he's on the schedule. And, uh, but anyway, I moved my vacation, shifted it a little bit, but I certainly didn't want to take him off the schedule. We're glad that he's able to speak. Um, just, oh, one thing, I forgot to mention an announcement. We have brand new, this is a, our brand new Connect card. If you're visiting with us, we'd love to get to know you. This is a card back on the table. You can fill this out, and give it to myself or Pastor Dan or the folks at the door, that would be fine. And we also created a brand new prayer card. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to go out on the prayer line, you can fill that out and give it again to myself or Dan or Cora. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, your prayer request gets sent out. So a couple new things back there. So, Ken? I will turn it over to you. Thank you for speaking this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. It's been a while. Uh, I apologize if my preaching muscles are flabby and uh, I flail, flail around a little bit here, but it's a, real, it's a real joy to be able to speak to you this morning. So I'm going to be speaking about Psalm 16, and so I'll start... Uh, <clears throat> by reading Psalm 16. Um, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O rock, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> you sure can. In C.S. Lewis's uh, Screw Tape Letters, I'm sure quite a number of you have read, there's an older, more experienced devil called Screw Tape who gives advice to his nephew Wormwood about how to tempt his patient, a young man that he's trying to tempt, and to bring him to damnation. Wormwood, the younger devil, naively wants to use pleasure to tempt the young man. But Screwtape warns him to be very careful, because when one deals with normal, healthy, and satisfying pleasures, they are on the enemy's ground, and it is his invention, not ours. He, that is God, made the pleasures. He adds that despite years of research, hell has not been able to produce any authentic pleasures. All the devils can do is twist the pleasures that God has made so that humans take them in ways that are not natural, not permitted by the one who made them, or not truly pleasurable. So things go along fine for a while. Wormwood seems to be making excellent progress in influencing the young man. But then he makes a fatal mistake. He allows the young man to do two things that he genuinely and deeply enjoys. The first is to read a book for pleasure, and the second is to go for a walk in the country to an old mill and have a cup of tea. These positive pleasures, when true humans truly like and enjoy doing something for its own sake, says Screwtape, serve the cause of what he calls the enemy. They have the effect of awakening humans to reality and reminding them of their true selves. And this makes Screwtape furious. Speaking of God now, he's a hedonist at heart. All those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only a facade or only like foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out in his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ugh. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He has a bourgeois mind. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are, th there are things for... For humans to do all day long without his minding in the least. Sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, praying, playing, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's any use to us. We fight under cruel disadvantages. Nothing is naturally on our side, he says in self-pity. The point that C.S. Lewis is making is clear. Contrary to what many people think, God is the author of pleasure. He is not its enemy. In fact, God, the God who created sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, who filled the earth with intoxicating beauty, the scent of flowers, the taste of fruit, the harmony of birdsong, the grandeur of mountain vistas, how could such a God be against pleasure when he is its true source. Same sounds strange for me to say it, but God is happy. He is the happiest of all beings. His happiness knows no bounds, and it overflows in the variety, bounty, and effervescence of nature. Nothing can destroy God's happiness. He experiences perfect pleasure and delight and joy. The scriptures tell us that he takes delight in his people. He rejoices over them in the way that a young bridegroom rejoices over his bride. He rejoices in doing good for his people and showing them mercy 
and in the perfections of kindness and justice and righteousness. And this God made human beings in his own image for his own pleasure and with the capacity to experience happiness and pleasure. He has given them a purpose, the purpose to love and enjoy him forever and to be his partners in creation. So we have to reject the idea that pleasure is some kind of satanic invention or a perversion of our being. It is central to our God-given nature. And yet we stumble over pleasure. We're persistently in error and we constantly thwart our own interests and our own good. St. Augustine saw the problem in terms of the human will. He argued that humans were created as desiring creatures, made to love and seek union with their creator, to find their fullness and joy in him. At the beginning of the Confessions, he writes, You made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Yet ever since the fall, humans have been loving in a wrong and disordered way. This is what he says in The City of God. And thus beauty, which is indeed God's handiwork, but only a temporal, carnal, and lower kind of good, is not fitly loved in preference to God, the eternal, spiritual, and unchangeable good. When the miser prefers his gold to justice, it is through no fault of the gold, but of the man. And so with every created thing, for though it be good, it may be loved with an evil as well as with a good love. It is loved rightly when it is loved ordinately, evilly when inordinately. So that it seems to me that it is a brief but true definition of virtue to say it is the order of love, or in the Latin, the ordo amoris. That concept of the order of love is a very key one for C.S. Lewis. It's not a matter of having to choose between loving God and rejecting all else. Rather, it's a matter of putting first things first, and in so doing, gaining all things. Lewis once wrote a letter to his beloved wife, Joy. I love you as I should, he wrote. I must worship God as creator. When I have learnt to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but increased. When earthly love is disordered, the result is idolatry the love of the creature above the creator. Idolatry is not just images set up in pagan temples. It is everywhere around us. It's the intrusion of worldly desires, selfish pursuits, and misplaced attachments that subvert our primary purpose to love God and enjoy him forever. And Lewis had a profound and prophetic understanding of what we might call the problem of pleasure in the modern world. And he thought that it's not that there are too many forms of pleasure available to us, that we're drawn away from God by the strength and intensity of those pleasures, and that God begrudges our enjoyment, that God is a great killjoy or buzzkill who resents our fun. Rather, it is that we, are fool- we foolishly seek pleasure as an end in itself, rather than the creator, who is the source of all pleasure. We substitute lesser pleasures for greater ones. This is what he wrote in a sermon called The Weight of Glory. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. 
Philosophers and psychologists talk about the happiness paradox. The more we focus on the question of our own happiness, the less attainable it becomes. When people try hard to be happy, when they make feeling happy their main goal, they become aware instead of their unhappiness. If we aim too directly at happiness, we miss it. Happiness is a byproduct, not a goal. William Bennett said that happiness is like a fussy cat. If you try to coax it and call it, it won't come. But if you pay no attention to it and go about your business, sooner or later, it's going to rub up against your leg and jump into your lap. More profoundly, the great Jewish psychologist and philosopher um, in Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, said, happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself, or as the byproduct, and get this, think about the, the theological implication of this, of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Very similar to this is the paradox of hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, sometimes called the paradox of pleasure. The more we seek pleasure as an end in itself, the less pleasurable pleasure becomes. The harder we have to work to achieve the same level of enjoyment, the same high. Pleasure-seeking produces an inner vacuum that can never be filled. In fact, what happens is it becomes harder to attain pleasure. We become desensitized, blunted to ordinary and natural pleasures. And we can see this law of diminishing returns in the phenomenon of addiction. Substances, pornography, and ever-increasingly technology are not only controlling us, trapping us in compulsive and destructive cycles of behavior, but they are progressively diminishing our capacity to experience true and natural pleasure. It's sad to say, but these little microcomputers, I don't have, mine is, <laughs> mine is at the back, but uh, the, our phones that we carry around with us eat up many hours of our day and isolate us from face-to-face -face interaction with others. What do they offer us in return? A few little hits of dopamine to anesthetize us to the highs and lows of living. And don't even get me started on social media. That witch's brew of digital lust, envy, malice, and pride. If anything, we don't live in a, an age of hedonism, but we live in an age of anhedonia, the reduced ability to experience pleasure in what we formerly enjoyed. Instead, we have numbness, boredom, mm -hmm. and the loss of interest in life's experiences. Psalm 16 is a powerful word to us about pleasure and praise, and it helps us unravel the problem and the paradox of pleasure. And I want to just point out three things about the psalm. The first is the language of the psalm is about pleasure, but it also gives us pleasure. The, the psalm has a rich vocabulary of pleasure, delight, and enjoyment. When the psalmist says, for example, in verse 3, the noble in whom is all my delight, he uses a Hebrew word which has the root meaning of bending or inclining towards someone in an attitude of caring, attentiveness, and protection. Think about that. When in verse 6, he says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, the Hebrew word naim that he uses has the root meaning of beautiful, sweet, and lovely. It's the same root out of which we get the name Naomi, my sweet one, my lovely one. And it can point toward visual beauty, but particularly it points toward the beauty of sound, delightful music, or a sweet, low voice. When he says in verse 6, I have a delightful heritage, he's using a Hebrew word which means beautiful or pleasing to the eye. At its root is the sense of something bright, shining, fair, and clear. 
There's a related Arabic word that means the removal of a veil from a woman's face, the moment her bright beauty shines out. And in verse 9 and 10, the psalmist says, My heart is glad, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. These are different forms of a Hebrew word, uh, which means sprout or flourish. It has the sense of joy bursting forth in an exultant way, a kind of peak joy or ecstasy. Now, why does that matter? Because the psalmist isn't just expressing ideas about pleasure and delight that are then to be translated in an abstract way. The psalmist is writing a poem, a song, a work of art that is intended to move us. He is using language in a way that actually gives us pleasure and delight, that actually draws us into the circle of joy, that gives us a taste of it. Second thing I want to say about the psalm is that the psalmist's praise of God is rooted in pleasure, both his own pleasure and the pleasure of God. Now, even though he's never read St. Augustine, the psalmist understands the ordo amoris, the order of love. The psalmist puts first things first. Yahweh is loved above all created things, and then, in the right order, degree and proportion, all created things are to be loved for Yahweh's sake. He says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. He's not saying that nothing is good except Yahweh. That would contradict the scripture, right? The creator pronounced that creation is good. He saw it, and it was good. But he is saying that the very goodness of good things consists in their relation to a good creator. They're not rightly enjoyed apart from him or for their own sake. Yahweh, however, is the only being who can be enjoyed for his own sake. St. Augustine said it this way, If the Creator is truly loved, that is, if he is himself is loved, and not another thing in his stead, he cannot be evilly loved. We do well to love that which, when we love it, makes us live well and virtuously. If we praise God as, he ought, as we ought to praise him, we'll, we will acknowledge the many things he's done for us, and the psalmist rhymes those off. Verse 1 and 5, he says that Yahweh keeps him safe. He gives him refuge and security. In verse 7, he says Yahweh counsels and guides him. But if we focus only on what God has done for us, our praise can become transactional and mechanical, something that we owe to him and are obligated by duty to offer him. But the psalmist doesn't do this. He praises Yahweh not the things that Yahweh does for him. Yahweh himself is his treasure, his joy, his very great reward. He says it in verse 5 and 6, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Those words, portion and inheritance, are referring to the same thing. In the Old Testament, all the tribes of Israel were given an inheritance in terms of land. There was one exception, and that was the Levites, and particularly the uh, descendants of Aaron. In Numbers 18.20, God says to Aaron, I am your portion and your inheritance. So the psalmist is not literally identifying himself as a Levite or as a member of the priesthood. What he's saying is that at the end of the day, he is like Aaron. God is his all in all. God is his sufficiency. God is the sole focus of his affections. Because he is single-minded, the psalmist cannot be moved. Shifts of fortune, worldly losses, they cannot move him. He can experience intense pleasure in God, communing with him by day and by night, keeping his eyes always on the Lord, and even being instructed in the middle of the night by Yahweh. His praise is sincere. There's nothing forced or compelled about it. It's not compliment. It's not flattery. It's not ministry, ministry to God's ego. It's a spontaneous outpouring. Again, I, I, I quote C.S. Lewis, who's just so 
rich in his thought on this subject. He writes in Reflection on the Psalms that when we eat a great meal, when we see a magnificent sunset, when we look at the beautiful face of our beloved, we overflow with praise. We can't help ourselves. It's natural. Yet some, somehow when we think of pleasing God, it tends to become a dreary duty that's compelled. He says, all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise, lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical persons, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, and even sometimes politicians or scholars. Just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmist is telling everyone to praise God, is doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. We delight to praise what we find valuable, and we can't help ourselves. The praise is not just an expression or acknowledgement. The praise completes our enjoyment. It's a pleasure, the greatest of pleasures, to praise that which gives us pleasure. It's a greater pleasure to share pleasure than to hoard it and keep it to ourselves. When we've known something exquisite, how can we not tell it? How can we keep it bottled up inside? It has to burst, burst forth. And there's one more thing that's amazing about praise. Praise is a great privilege and pleasure because in praising God, in praising him from our hearts, we in fact bring him pleasure. The scriptures tell us that God dwells in the praise of his people. When we praise him, we please him, and we commune with him. Thirdly and lastly, the pleasure of praise points beyond itself to an infinite circle of pleasure. The received wisdom about pleasure is that it is merely fleeting and temporal. The philosophy of carpe diem, seize the day, says that youth is the time of pleasure and we should grab all the sensual enjoyment we can before time, age, and death catch up with us. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a flying. And I don't want to underestimate that. Death is a formidable enemy with a powerful sting. But the psalmist grasps a hope that transcends the power of death and the grave. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Is the psalmist here claiming that he will never die? Obviously not. In Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes this very passage when he preaches to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, and he acknowledges, he says, David the psalmist died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. David did enter the realm of the dead, and his body did see decay. However, says Peter, David was a prophet. He knew that God had promised that one of his descendants would sit on his throne. David's words, said Peter, point prophetically to Jesus the Anointed One, the one of whom the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The greatest joy and delight of God is in his Son. Psalm 16 prophetically envisions the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus, who, says Peter, was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Peter links this ancient psalm and the psalmist with his own moment, the dawn of the gospel and of the church. And by implication, it takes in the whole church of Jesus Christ throughout time. It comes down and, and speaks directly to us. 
And what was prophesied in the psalm has come true and has opened the way of salvation and joy to all people. All of God's people, past, present, and future, participate in the resurrection and enthronement of the Messiah. His resurrection to life is the earnest or guarantee of ours. His triumph is our triumph. His joy is our joy. And my friends, that joy will never end. It will go on forever. We will walk with our Savior on the path of life. And we will be filled with joy in the presence of the Lord where there are eternal pleasures. Amen. Pastor. guys let's stand and worship our king
presence of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. worship team and thank you Ken for sharing this morning. Wow, we're called to be Christian hedonists, aren't we? We're called to pursue pleasure, but not in pleasure itself. We submit ourselves to God and there we will find pleasure. And Ken marked, remarked at the first of his message God is the most happiest of all beings. And I want to leave you with this verse. I spoke on this a couple weeks ago. Where Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And his clothes turn white and a cloud appears. And can you hear the pleasure in the voice of the Father? When he says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Let's find our pleasure, our fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Amen.